Hello everyone. Hope you guys are doing well. Hope you guys are feeling okay. Uh, here we are in the first um, forum uh, of July. We're going to be talking about the integration of psychology and theology. And I'm going to give uh, everyone an opportunity, a few minutes to come on in. Hey Jay, God bless you. Hope you're doing well. Give everyone an opportunity to come on in so that we can have a spirited and fun conversation um, tonight. So we're going to be talking about uh, the integration of psychology and theology for the next four weeks. And uh, I think we're going to have a good time. And of course, the conversations can go beyond um, this forum here and take it out into, uh, into your livelihoods, into your jobs, uh, your schooling, wherever you're at, because I think this is something that informs everything that we do. Uh, we are, uh, all of us are theologians. And to a certain degree, all of us are psychologists because we are dealing with human behavior all the time. And we are dealing with thoughts about God all the time. So we're going to see how we can integrate um, theology and psychology in the next um, four weeks. Of course, there's so much information um, out there. So we're just going to do it, do it briefly, of course, um, for the next four weeks, one hour every Wednesday. Um, and perhaps then it'll go even further uh, in the future. Hey, Mitch, good to see you there. So I'm going to give a couple of more minutes to let, uh, let more people um, come on in. Um, if you're there and, and you can both see and hear me, please let me know because, you know, computers um, want to do whatever they want to do. So from my end, it tells me that I have, uh, um, that my system is a little bit low, even though I have a thousand gigs, but I don't know what you're seeing from your side. So let me know that this is working fine. You're able to hear me and see me um, and we'll keep on going um, from there. Hello, Rosa. I know you recently uh, friended me, so we don't really know each other, but I think you're a friend of a friend, so I'm glad that you are here. Eliana, God bless you. Good to see you there. I hope um, Rick is fine also. Patricia, good evening. Good to see you there. All right, so I'll give a couple of more uh, seconds to let people come on in, and then we're going to get into this conversation. Hey, Jeannie, good to see you. Okay, I was going to say, Mother Wildflower Seeds, who's that? It's Enid. <laughs> Every time I read your name, I love it. I'm glad you are here also. Hey, Sasha, Dios te bendiga. So we're going to begin with a short prayer and then get right on into this. We thank you, Lord, for your love, your mercy, your goodness, your greatness, your holiness, your perfection, my Lord. Father, because you are all over us, my Lord. Lead us by your Holy Spirit. Give us wisdom and understanding beyond what we currently have, my Lord. Inform what we do here. Lead us by your Holy Spirit, Lord. Open up our eyes even wider than what they are open, my God. The eyes of our understanding, the eyes of our hearts, my God. That we would know, my Lord, what moves in the spiritual realms, my Lord, and even in our flesh. Guide us. Give us wisdom and understanding. I ask that you bless everyone that is here present, my Lord, those that will see this in the future, that you, my Lord, would be the great informer of all that we do here. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Oh, there's Ricky. Good to see you there. Sandy, God bless you. Ah, and there's one of the parents I used to work with. Hey, how are you, Joanna? Good to see you. Hey, Eddie, God bless you. So what we're going to talk about, and we're going to get right into this, because we have an hour and you know that I, I, I stick to the schedule, or I generally like to stick to the schedule, um, the integration of psychology and theology. This is a field that I love very, very much. I taught on this at Nyack College for five years, and I had a good time. A couple of my students are on um, here um, now. It was fantastic. I, I loved it. I learned so much from the students. I hope they learned something from me, and it helped me to understand that psychology and theology are two incredible fields, that, and they continue to es expand. There's just so much information um, out there. So what I wanted to do is for the next four weeks, I mean, we, we often have downtime uh, in the summer. I'm still working um, for the summer, but um, because this is something that I enjoy doing. For me, it's not a chore. I said, let me, let me offer this uh, Wednesdays in, in July and see how many people respond. So thank you guys for um, responding. Bilma, good to see you. Hey, Marcos, God bless you. Careful driving your trucks out there. Uh, so I said, let me offer this and see 
um, how well how well it goes. And then in the future, of course, we will continue to do other things. But the integration of psychology and theology. I put some questions out, out there right in the beginning of the chat. Were you able to see those questions? If you were able to see them, let me know. Because we're going to get right into those questions in a second. Right in the beginning of the chat, you should see them there. In case you can't, but if you can, you can just repost them. The first one is, are psychology and theology mutually exclusive? So I'm asking you that. Are psychology and theology mutually exclusive? In other words, do they have to exist apart from each other? Now, of course, I have a particular opinion on that. But what do you guys think? Um, some of you are, are, in the, are in the field. So you know um, uh, what, what's going on um, out there. So what do you think? Are psychology and theology mutually exclusive? And that's a good idea, Mitch. I should have pinned them in the beginning, but now I don't want to mess with this and, 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 <laughs> and mess everything up here. So again, the question is, are psychology and theology mutually exclusive? What do you think? Do they have to exist apart from each other? And how can we put them together? I have some information here, but maybe you've come across this before. Certainly my students at NIAC, you, uh, we spoke about this um, quite a bit. Where do they intersect? Where do they divide? So here we have, I have a, a, a small copy of the DSM-5, and um, this is being updated. It's gonna be the DSM-5 uh, TR, I think, coming up um, soon. So that, that's, gonna, that's gonna come out. So DSM, right? The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders. That's on, on one hand. This is what psychiatrists use to say, well, you have this thing or you have that thing or you have the other thing. You have a borderline personality disorder. Um, you have a, the, whatever disorder. They use this book. But then, if you're a servant of the Lord, you use this book, right? The Holy Bible. How do we use both of these books together. What is the possibility um, of that? How can we use them together? So, question. I, I want to know because I'm still I'm still working on that as I as I seek to honor the Lord uh, and to do things well. How can we bring psychology and theology together? So, of course, we have to explain terms. Theology, very simple: the study uh, of God and the things of God. Very simple. Psychology. Study of human behavior, very simple. How do we bring those things together? Now, that's, that may not be a question that we are going to fully answer here, but they are something that we should be thinking about. Yes, in it says they are intertwined, and I love that idea. When you have leaves that grow together, they are intertwined, and it's very difficult to separate them. When you start to change the way you think, then the things around you begin to change. That's excellent, that's a good quote right there. That's good, that's good. Um, the Bible has a lot to say about the mind, and definitely psychology has a lot to say uh, about the mind. Ricky um, says, a person's psychology can influence their theology. Absolutely, and obviously, vice versa. But which came first, the chicken or the egg, as the people say, psychology or theology? In it says, walking with the Lord renews our minds which then affects our psyche. That's an excellent point. You, I'm sure you know uh, the verse, Isaiah 26.3. Those who keep their minds, set their minds on God, what? They're going to receive his perfect peace. But how does that play out when we are overwhelmed with other thoughts? Well, then that's something we have to discuss. How do we get our minds to be focused on the things of God when so many other things get in the way? Well, we'll talk about that when we get to the end of today's of today's forum. Oh, Eddie brings up a good point. Intertwining sometimes not good for one plant because it gets strangled by the stronger plant. Uh, and the same thing with psychology and theology. Sometimes theology may strangle your psychology or vice versa. So how do we keep them balanced? 
That's important. How do we keep psychology and theology in a good tension um, with each other? Now, um, uh, in my opinion, uh, theology came first, and then psychology comes from that. I mean, we have thousands of years of theology. Uh, and the Bible was written over, over a period of a, of a few thousand years. So we know that we have the wisdom of the ancients there. Psychology is relatively new. Uh, maybe 200 years or, or even less than that. It's relatively new. And a lot of the ideas that we get from uh, psychology really come from theology. When you, when you think about the way the mind functions, uh, Proverbs talks about the way a man thinks is how the man becomes. Well, that's, that's straight up um, psychology, but that comes from uh, the Bible, book of Proverbs, written, what, 3,000 years ago or, or, or more than that? So we have to consider, we have to consider where, where do we bring them together? Where do we separate them? Where do we say, no, 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 we draw the line here. That's important for us, not only as psychologists, which I just said we all are psychologists because we're all focused on human behavior, but we're also theologians. Eliana says, uh, I think using the biopsychosocial and spiritual model can help assess how to help a person accordingly. And that's exactly correct. Biology, the way we are made up. Psychology, of course, the way our mind functions. Um, sociology, the things and the people that we interact with. And spirituality, what the way uh, our spirit functions together with all of those other things. So we cannot separate one from the other because we we are a whole person. Right? You're not a piece of a person. You are a whole person. And so you have all of these elements working together inside of you. Sasha says, <clears throat> I had this thought a while ago. Psyche equals soul and pathology equals sickness. And so when we look, <clears throat> let's see if I can get the whole thing here. And so when we look at psychology, uh, or the study of the soul and its sicknesses, we can and should always look to Jesus first as he came to save and heal us to the uttermost. All this to say, I think effective psychology takes from the truths of Jesus to address and study human behaviors. And that's excellent. And that's something that we can do without downing the individual, because I think that that's often what we uh, believers do. We'll, we will talk about someone that has uh, some mental health problem <clears throat> as, as if they are a pariah. We need to stay away from them because we might catch their disease. And obviously that's not a biblical model. We suffer with those who are suffering. And we're going to come back to that uh, a little bit later on. Um, Lorena says, hey, Lorena, good to see you. When you are a believer, you will understand the connection by discernment given by the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly right. And we need to we need to get into the word of God. And then we need to get into some of the psychology books. So that we can also understand how people think about the way our brain functions. Um, Jay says, theology helps with the wellness of the mind. It certainly does help when we have a good and healthy theology. Because um, even in, in, our, in our types of churches, we can become cultish, which is very dangerous. Yeah, uh, and Jay adds to that. We need to be careful what type of theology we follow. Absolutely. And Michelle agrees. <clears throat> Eddie says, Jesus taught us to be kind to one another, to love one another. Uh, isn't what we, what we look for when we deal with people on an everyday basis, just to be good. So we have to understand love transcends sometimes our, our feelings, um, even how we have been hurt by an individual. Love transcends that. But that is a part of psychology. We have to understand that our behavior is informed by things that have occurred to us in our past. The way we have learned to cope, whether it's we've learned to cope in a help, healthy way or we've learned to cope in a maladaptive pattern. Uh, maybe maybe you're, you're the kind of individual that when, when trouble starts, you want to walk away. That's kind of the way I deal with things that I don't want to deal with. I'm like, uh, uh, let's leave that for later. Uh, later meaning let's, deal, let's leave that for never. That's not healthy. So I have had to learn to say, nope, 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 nope. Let's try to take care of business now. But again, psychology and theology will inform how we live on a daily basis. Carmen um, tells us that discernment through the Holy Spirit is the key word. Discerning is an excellent word. And that's, in that's an interesting word to use in this forum because we can discern 
things or understand or judge are other words that basically mean the same thing through theology by using the word of God we get an understanding of people's behavior but at the same time from psychology we get an understanding of people's behavior you can look at body language um, you can see the way they move the way they talk the way they conduct themselves their behaviors in front of other individuals so it is important that we not discount theology and it is important that we not discount psychology let's see if we can somehow bring them together and come to a healthy understanding of how they inform each other here's another book i believe this book is out of print but this is the, one of the books that i used um, at NIAC. it's an excellent excellent book it's called care for the soul let me see if i can get it really close to you guys care for the soul you get some information there care for the soul Exploring the Intersection of Psychology and Theology. It's edited by Mark McMinn and Timothy Phillips. I believe it is out of print. I got my copy on Amazon like mm, about 10 years ago and I used it so much that it broke and so I, have to, I got this binding made for it. Excellent, excellent book. It's really academic. So you gotta struggle with, with some of the, the work that's in it. But it is fantastic and it's a book that explores that intersection of psychology and theology so i asked a couple of questions are psychology and theology mutually exclusive where do they intersect where do they divide we may not get to all of those things today i'm hoping that in the next four weeks we will get to to a few few of those things eddie tells us that uh first corinthians 13 4 through 7 teaches us how to deal with people on an everyday basis. I believe that's a chapter on love. You know what the, the beautiful thing about that is? It tells us what to do, right? So it's giving us theology because it's, it's, that's the expectation of God's love so that we are going to emulate God's love. And then the psychology part comes in when we don't do those things, although we know we should do them, right? Our brain gets in the way because the person hurt me, because the person spoke nasty about me, because the person betrayed me, whatever it is. So again, this is why we need to bring psychology and theology together in our own behavior. It's easy for me to diagnose somebody else, but do I diagnose me? And this is where we need to, we need to go. If we're going to be helpful to other individuals, we first need to get gain some understanding of ourselves. Because I, I don't think we ever really truly know ourselves. Only God knows us completely. So I got some information here <clears throat> from a book called Understanding the Bible. And this is adapted um, from that. One of the wisdom books, the book of Proverbs. Listen to this regarding theology. And it's just, it's only talking about the book of Proverbs. We have uh, uh, 65 other books in the Bible that, that can help us. But listen to this. <clears throat> the nature of wisdom as centered in God also guides us towards practical skill in living. This is only the book of Proverbs it's talking about. From an ethical standpoint, so there's an ethical standpoint. There's ethics having to do with psychology and the way we behave towards others, the way we live. This leads to flourishing, not only for the individual, but also for the community. The Proverbs of the Bible help guide us towards wise attitudes and behavior and away from foolish ones. Again, psychology, human behavior. Some of the insights found in this book, remember only in the book of Proverbs, include relationships, sexual ethics, listening to advice, work ethics, business ethics, planning, dealing with authority, the misuse of alcohol, relationships with friends and neighbors, conflict, anger, taking care of the vulnerable, and the danger of pride. Think about that. The danger of pride. Just the book of Proverbs covers all of those things. So that's something that we need to consider. We need to consider. I like what Eddie says. I'm going to hit 70 years soon, and I'm still trying to figure out who the heck I am. <laughs> I love that. I love that. God can help you um, with that. Carmen, you asked for the name of the book? I'll tell you one more time. Care for the Soul. Exploring the Intersection of Psychology and Theology. You might be able to find it on Amazon.
Care for the Soul by Mark McMinn and Timothy Phillips. You can rewind this later on and you'll hear it again. So just the book of Proverbs, that theological book, has a lot of insight, has a lot of wisdom. You know what it has? It has a lot of psychology that comes straight from heaven. And a lot of it was accumulated or, or compiled by Solomon, one of the wisest, if not the wisest man who ever lived. What is he telling us? That there's a wisdom that comes down from heaven that can inform the way we live. There, right there, right there, we see the integration of psychology and theology because you're using the word of God to understand, oh, I need to run away from this woman. That's not my wife. Oh, I need to run away from drink because I know in the past I used to get, get all drunk and that didn't work for me. I need to run away from this thing or I need to get closer to wise people. So understand that there is a wisdom that comes down from heaven that is very helpful to us. Oh, thank you, Darby, for, for posting that. Uh, hey, Carrie, good to see you there. So we need to understand that when we are seeking to integrate these two things, it's not, it's not a one time and it's done. This is really a lifelong process, and we need to begin to understand, whoa, there's all this theology, okay, the Bible, talking about God, and then how do I apply that on a daily basis? Because you know that sometimes you and I undermine ourselves. We hurt ourselves. We know what the Bible says about good thoughts, and we still have negative thoughts. We know, well, uh, Jay said it right now, pride is, one, pride is one of the main culprits that affect our psychological status. It will at times overtake our theological approach to life. I love that. You know what? So, so true. We can get so prideful in our theological knowledge that we become psychological messes. And I'll say it a different way. We can come become so prideful in our, in our psychological knowledge that we become theological messes. We don't have balance. You have to have balance. You can know all of the Bible. And if you don't know how to treat somebody, then psychologically, you're not a good person. And you can know all of psychology and do it away from God. And what happens? What have you gained? The Bible is clear. What happens if you gain the whole world and you lose your soul? What did you gain? You, gain? you gained nothing. Carrie says it well. I agree. It is a holistic view of a person, which is how God views us. Absolutely. God does not see you in pieces. As a matter of fact, the Bible is clear that God sees us whole and complete through the finished work of Jesus Christ. But if we, if we were to sit together, you and I, and really open up ourselves to how we see ourselves, some of us are going to have holes. We're going to be missing limbs. There's going to be some fragmentation in our life because we recognize, wow, Paul said it. I want to do good. Man, but I do evil sometimes. I don't want to talk like that. Man, but sometimes I say the wrong thing. I, I don't want to I don't want to be the way my parents taught me because sometimes they taught us wrong things and and right things but I, I've heard the example uh, uh, um, once where a person says you know sometimes I open my mouth and my mother comes out <laughs> you understand that we sometimes continue to perpetrate the sins or the psychological biases of our ancestors because it's built in and we need the renewing by the word of God, theology, to get us right. <laughs> Jay says, I do not want to do that. I might scare myself to death. <laughs> well, Eddie, that's a question that we're not going to really answer here. Why do some people use the Bible to downgrade and persecute other people? Because they are living the Bible according to their standards, not God's standards. That, that's it. That's it. We can't go further um, than that. The Bible, you can use the Bible, you can use the Bible to heal someone, and you can use it, also use it as a club to hurt people. It's your choice on how you use the Bible. You can use the DSM-5 to, to heal and help and guide people, or you can use it a, as a way to hinder people and jail them by the diagnosis that you gave them. So really, I learned this a while back, and I know you guys know this too. 
Uh, if you have a therapist, that therapist has a lot to do with, with whether you get better or you get worse. So keep that in mind, those of you who practice therapy out there. That's really uh, important. Eileen says, understanding our weaknesses helps us take a step back to think before speaking. And that's excellent. That is exactly what James tells us, the book of James, where he says that, that there is speech. There is some speech that, that, uh, that comes or, or some, some understanding, some knowledge that is diabolical, that comes straight from hell, that is bestial. It's, it's like a beast. You're like a beast. When you speak in that way, and then there is wisdom that comes from heaven. We choose which is the wisdom that we are going to use by the way we speak, by the way we act, by the way we conduct ourselves. Again, human behavior, psychology. How do you walk? How do you talk? How do you think? How do you treat other individuals? Sasha says, because on some level, using the Bible to put someone down is likened to us uh tattling on our peer <laughs> to jesus in order to distract from the things we need to be delivered or matured from that's very good oh definitely definitely um it's easier for me to point out your faults than to point out my faults and it might be easier for you to point out my faults than to point out your faults that's the reality isn't that what jesus told us you're, you're, we're, we're worrying about the speck in someone else's eye well we have what a giant log in, in our eye so that, that's really important that we, we, we understand again, again, we're talking about the integration of psychology and theology. We need to understand where we are coming from, why we are the way we are. As I age, I keep getting older, obviously, I begin to notice, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is a pattern uh, in my family. I have to be careful about this so that I don't commit the same mistakes that people before me committed. But that takes wisdom from heaven. And I also have to take a step back, as you say, and relax myself. Jay says, we can carry generational tendencies and they are strongholds in our minds that keep us locked in psychological prisons. That's excellent. And that is so true. Um, Paul talks to us about some of those strongholds. But then he says that the way we battle them is not physically. But it is with the armor that God has provided for us. So again, 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 and this is really, really important. We can be attacked psychologically, the way our brain functions, but we have to fight theologically with the word of God. Remember, when, when Jesus was approached by Satan, it was the Holy Spirit that took him there. Let's not get it wrong. Jesus wasn't just hanging around. He was taken by the Holy Spirit onto, into the wilderness or into desert places so that he could be tested or tempted by Satan. And then what did he do? Every time Satan came with a temptation, right? Satan came with psychology. This is what you have to do to prove that you are the son of God. And Jesus responded with theology. All from the book of Deuteronomy. No, because the Bible says, and he quoted the Bible. Do you know that, that Satan is allergic to scripture? And even more allergic when you know scripture and you live scripture. Even more allergic. So that's really important for us to understand. Bring these things together. Don't stay stuck on one thing. Okay, so I have some more written here. The book of Second Peter Verses 1, 2, 3, and 4 can inform how we are to live. So if you have your Bibles, you can, you can look there. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2, uh, two 3, and 4. So Peter's speaking to the church, to us, and he says, Grace and peace be yours in abundance, not a little bit, but in abundance, right? O overwhelming abundance. How? And here we go with theology, with theology. Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. How much knowledge do you have of God that you got from God? Now this is really important because I, as I grew up in the Hispanic Pentecostal church, and I don't knock them. I don't knock them because I learned discipline. I learned to pray. I learned to be faithful. I learned to stand for hours in the Spanish Pentecostal church. 
but I also learned how to be judgmental and how to point out other people's problems and not look at my own. So, hello? But here, here, we're being told, grace and peace be yours, but how? Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, through theology, a knowledge of God. Now, how is that possible? Because God isn't coming down and revealing things to us. He's not speaking to us. You got to get into his word. You hear sermons. You have to get into the word of God. You have to discern what his call is for your life, his purpose for your life. So here's a question for you. Are you flourishing? F-L-O-U-R-I-S-H-I-N-G. Flourishing or are you languishing? L-A-N-G-U-I-S-H-I-N-G. Are you flourishing or are you languishing? Those are two words that, 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 are, that are against each other. If, you, if, you, if you're my friend on, on Facebook, you know, I'm always posting on, on my plants. And my hostess is doing this and the magnolia tree is doing that. And the rhododendron is, is, is doing this or the other thing. Because I love to see nature flourishing. But what makes it flourish? You know why it flourishes? Because it's simply abiding, it's staying in the place where it was call, called to be, and it is shining in that place. Those plants aren't thinking about, wow, I need to be growing. Wow, I'm not getting enough water. Wow, this, the, the, dirt, the dirt that I'm planted in is not, is not strong enough for me. Wow, it doesn't have the right mineral content. It's not worrying about those things. It's simply in the place where it was called to be. The plants are living out their purpose. They're flourishing. But then you have plants that are languishing. What's happening? They're not getting enough water. Maybe it's a plant that needs shade and it's in the sun. Maybe it's a plant that needs sun and it's in the shade. So it languishes. The green leaves turn, <clears throat> turn yellow and, it, and it's not strong. And, and if it produces flowers, they're, they're, they're sickly flowers. So what does that mean? You and I, are either flourishing or we're languishing. There's no middle ground. There, there is no middle ground. We have to understand that staying still is not an option. Now, I, what I mean by that is not that you're in constant motion. There's people jumping around and doing a million things and they're really doing nothing. What I'm talking about is, go back to 2 Peter 1 and 2. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Are you flourishing in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord? Are you flourishing in those areas? If you are, guess what? You're doing what uh, Eddie said before from uh, Corinthians 13. You are loving how God loves, even if it hurts you. Your psychology your behavior is one of loving others in spite of their treatment of you. Why? Because your psychology is being informed by your theology. And that's really important. <laughs> and, and Enid says that she learned to play the, the bandera in Pentecostal church. <laughs> Beautiful. The tambourine, I guess um, you're, you're saying. But what we need to understand, go down to verse 3. God's divine power, his divine power has given us everything we need. Listen to that word. Everything. When the Bible says everything, that means that there are no exclusions. Nothing is left out. So right now, you and I have everything that we need for what? Keep on going. For a godly life through our knowledge, again, our knowledge, our theology, our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Guess what? Why do we minimize the call of God when the call of God upon you and the call upon, of God upon me is so massive? It is so great. You should be lighting wherever you walk, even if you're not feeling good. But you have to allow your psychology to be informed by God's theology. You have to let the word ooze out of your pores. That when people see you, why? Why are you smiling? Why are you laughing? 
Why do you have that cheery attitude? I, 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 I in, in, the, in my job, I stand in the front as the children come off the school buses and I greet them, and I give them high fives and I give them pounds and I make them laugh and I joke with them and they yell at me and, and, and the day starts off well. You know why? Because I know that my mindset, right? My psychology is going to affect their psychology. When was the last time you changed somebody's mood by changing your own mood? You can do that. It's not a trick. It's not a game. It's simply doing what God calls us to be, calls us to do, that we would infect everybody that is around us by our right attitude. It says it right here. We, God has given us everything. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. And verse four, and through these, what he has given us, through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises. And God is a promise keeper. Boy, somebody may have broken their promise to you. But God is a promise keeper. Through these, what I just mentioned before, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, through those promises that God has given us, you may participate in the divine nature. Wait a minute. Your theology and your psychology are informed by the fact that you and I partake in the divine nature nature. You know what that means? I don't want it to sound cultish, and I'm not trying to go there, but you and I, when we are doing what we should be doing as servants of God, become God-like. Now, that doesn't mean that you're levitating or any of those things. What it means is that you affect everybody around you. You know, in the very beginning, in those six days when God was creating, and the Bible says that God saw that it was good, and God saw that it was good, and God saw that it was good. As he created through the word, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who the Bible says keeps everything together through his own power. When you and I conduct ourselves in a manner, like I read here, that honors others. When you're growing abundantly in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, guess what? You become attractive. To other people. And it's not a sexual attraction. It, it's people want to be intimate with you because they see, wow, there is something about that person that I want in my life. So, do you attract people or do you repel people? Unfortunately, unfortunately, I know some believers that are very repelling. The way they act, the way they act, kind of pushes people away, away from them. The way they treat other people, I see this in the job sometimes with people who say they are believers. I'm not going to say they're not. If you say you're a Christian, good, you're a Christian. Your conduct might say otherwise. But the way they act with the children demeans that child. So they have a demeaning psychology. God is not a demeaning God. He's an uplifting God. That's what he's doing. He seeks to bring us up. We said it right here. Peter just said it here. Second Peter 1, 2. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Everything. You're not lacking anything. You're not missing anything. I don't know why we as believers walk around with our head down like, oh, I'm missing this and I'm missing that. Maybe you're missing some things that you want. A house, a car, whatever it is. That, that's, that, that is a possibility. But in terms of who you are, your, your, mental, your mental makeup, you're not missing anything. Unless you are a believer who has decided to live the miserable Christian life. And that's a choice. And I think at some point we will get to speaking of, speak about that in the next um, four weeks. Yes, we are called to be light and salt. 
Light attracts and salt preserves. That's exactly what we should um, be doing. Lighting and preserving, strengthening other individuals. But that's up to us, whether you attract or you repel, whether you preserve or you denigrate. That is a choice that we make day after day after day. That is why we need to check ourselves. Check ourselves. Check yourself every day. Check yourself that you're leaving your house with the right attitude. Why we worry about our clothes. I worry about my three hairs here that they're pointing in the right direction. I, we worry about those things. What about worrying about that I am conducting myself in a manner that makes Jesus Christ attractive to other people? Because I know him. So just keep that in mind. Remember, we're talking about the integration of psychology and theology. They happen together. The way you live your life, your behavior, your psychology has to be informed by your theology, your beliefs about God. One is not going to happen without the other. We can't lie to ourselves. And Peter ends by this. He's talking about those great and precious promises. He tells us that through those promises that God has given us, we participate in the divine nature. Why? Having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Oh, so we put a check on our evil desires. How? By living a life that pleases God. By moving away from certain things that might bring us down. Now, I'm not talking about losing salvation, but I'm talking about living, like, like I mentioned before, the miserable Christian life where you're just going through the routine of serving God, but you have no joy, you have no strength, you have no desire. And this is why we need to uplift each other and strengthen each other with a good word. Watch your posts on Facebook. There should be posts that uplift other individuals. I don't know how many people I, I mute uh, or, what, or snooze for 30 days because, like, you know, you're going to post nonsense like that and then you say you're a Christian. Don't do that. Post things that are going to uplift others. That is part of your testimony, what you put out there. So just keep that in mind, that we need to be helping each other, and that is part of our psychology. Now, uh, in the book, in this book, there's a chapter called, uh, and I may have mentioned this in a previous class, called <clears throat> Pauline Psychotherapy. Now, my NIAC students, those of you who are uh, out there, Hey, Karen, good to see you. Uh, you remember some of this stuff. Really, really good stuff. Uh, and we, we uh, are told by, by the author, Robert C. Roberts, about the fact that Paul speaks about having, that we have two personalities. <laughs> How many personalities you got? Don't answer that. He says that we have at least two personalities. There is the new personality or that new psychology that wrapped itself around us when we knew Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Theology. That's a new humanity, a new self. These are the words that he uses, the inner self. Um, it demonstrates the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, all of those, all of those fruits. They are there. A personality that is flourishing. Remember, as a servant of God, you should be flourishing. It doesn't matter if you're on your deathbed. You should be flourishing on your deathbed because you're going to meet Jesus. We, we, I can't say that enough. We need to move away from living the Christian life as if we're getting beat up. You see the movies where people are, are walking up the, up the stairs of some, some cathedral and they're whipping themselves in the back to make themselves bleed? No, we go with joy as we seek to honor God. Again, the new personality that we received or the new psychology that we received when the Lord entered into our lives, what did he do? Gave us a personality that is flourishing and that promotes flourishing in others. How? Through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Guess what? The symbolic act of our going into the baptismal pool, going under and coming back means that we came back to life because we were headed towards destruction. The sad thing is that there are some believers that right now are living a life of destruction, but they're still believers. I believe they're going to go to heaven. I believe they love God, 
but they have gotten stuck in a negative psychology. Right now, they're stuck uh, in a place where it is very difficult for them to get out of because they have fooled themselves into thinking that there no longer is any escape. But I just read 2 Peter 1, 2, 3, and 4, where we are being told that we are partakers of the divine nature. So I'm going to stop for a second, and I'm going to throw a question out there. Focus only on this question right now. In the new personality that you received from God when you became a believer, or even now as a believer, where are you flourishing? I want you to answer that. Where are you flourishing? I'll give you a couple of minutes. Where are you flourishing? Where are you doing well as a servant of God? Oh, that's a good quote. Mitch says, um, quote from Douglas Moo, the fruit of the spirit is a list of actions that promote community life. And that's very good because um, very often we want to stick to ourselves. Nope. We are called to be in community, in fellowship, koinonia, as some people um, say. But here's the question. Where are you flourishing as a servant of God? Oh, I think I see those brains working out there. Where are you flourishing? You're doing well. Oh, very good. Enid says, being slow to speak and to anger. That's good. That's really good. Very nice. Okay. Karen says, in self-control. Oh, Eddie, I love that. I'm still very serviceable. I think you mean that you're helpful. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's good stuff. Keep on going. What else? Where are you flourishing? Okay. Michelle says, in sharing the word of God and encouraging others. What else? Where are you doing well that you can say, wow, I, I feel good. In, in doing this. I'm flourishing uh, in this area. Oh, Eileen says, teaching others and loving others. Very nice. Anybody else? Where are you flourishing that you could feel that you're doing well there? Oh, okay. Jovan says, in my humbleness. Okay. Very good. Where else? Or anybody else? Where are you flourishing? To feel that you're doing well, that your psychology huh, is a healthy psychology. Wow, I was taking my neighbor 34 times a week to the nursing home to see his aunt. That's a big deal. Thank you, Eddie. Jay says, I think my relationships with other people have grown exponen exponentially. <laughs> I do manage my temper better. That is very good. Very good. Oh, it wasn't 34 times, Eddie. It was 304. <laughs> Carmen says, learning to wait. Oh, that's a hard one. Not that it has to be at, at this moment. Very good. Uh, Jeannie says, reminding people that God loves them while I help them through a difficult time at work. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm Gary. Listening, serving, and giving of my time to others. Very nice. Now, here, here comes a, a more difficult one. Where are you languishing? Where are you not doing too well? Now, don't give me a list of sins here. I don't want to know that. I don't want to see that. Nobody needs to know that. This is an example of languishing. Languishing is, for example, uh, myself. That when... when um, when I don't want to deal with something, I, I, I will ignore it. I'll walk away from it. That's languishing because the problem never comes to fruition. Okay, Eliana says, persistence and patience in listening to others. Very good. That's flourishing. Okay, so here we go and get a languishing. Thank you, Mitch. Unfortunately, I usually focus on what I'm inadequate, but I might say learning and sharing what I learned. Okay, very good. Very good. So he gave a languishing. And he gave uh, a learning and sharing what he learned, which is a flourishing. Very nice. 
But again, now we're talking about languishing. Where do you feel you need God's help in exchanging a negative psychology for a positive psychology through theology, through a knowledge of God? Uh, Ricky says, I'm serviceable to others as well. And that's absolutely important. We have to be available and serviceable um, to others. But where are you languishing? Nobody wants to say where they're languishing. <laughs> See, this is where it gets difficult because we only want to say the good stuff, not the ugly. We don't want to. I said one about me. Yeah, sometimes I'd rather run away than deal with a situation. Oh, okay, Karen, very good. Self-doubt, absolutely. That is an area of, of languishing. Gary says, I'm flourishing. Where I am flourishing could also be where I need to know my limits and say no at times. Wow, that's good. So sometimes where you think you're flourishing, maybe you're neglecting somebody while you're helping somebody else and that needs to be dealt with. Jay says, at times I need to work on waiting. Absolutely. Okay, Ricky says, I'm languishing and trying to overextend myself to others. Yes, and usually when you overextend, you fall down, right? You tip over, the ladder comes crashing down, and that is a situation to consider. Okay, Michelle says, sometimes I put problems off to the, to the side. Okay, thank you, Patricia. Communication in my marriage. Jeannie says, not fully believing that I have what it takes to do God's work. Thank you. Thank you for, for being honest like that. Michelle says, and I'm still working on battling fear. Eddie says, I need to take more time for prayer and reading the Bible. Okay. Mitch says, I need to stop thinking of my past and fix my eyes on Jesus more than regret. Very good. Uh, Dima says, uh, in expressing uh, hurt to others. Okay, very good, very good. But we're not gonna stay there. We're not gonna stay there. Let's move on because we have eight minutes left and we're gonna continue this conversation. Actually, it's gonna be a different conversation, but we'll come to that next week. So we're speaking about the new personality. The new personality and it's a new self in itself demonstrates the fruits of the spirit. But then, remember, here, this was the question, how many personalities <laughs> you got? The dysfunctional personality is the one called the flesh, the body of sin, the body of flesh, the old self, the body. This self, Paul tells us, died with Jesus Christ on the cross and was buried with Christ by baptism. And that's important. We, to have a proper biblical psychology informed by theology, we need to understand that the person we used to be, even though right now we may still do the things of that person we used to be, we are no longer that person. And so the new behavior that is informed by our ability to partake in the divine nature should be what guides the way we speak, the way we think, the way we act. I know, easier said than done. Eileen says she's dealing with a mental battle, but God continues to win the battle with the knowledge he has given me. Very nice. Eddie says, I flourish in learning how to forgive. I languish in learning how to forgive myself. Thank you for your honesty. And Eliana says, being overprotective of my time and energy. At times I think I can give more than I, than I think I have. Very good. All of this is important. You know why? The fact that you were able to write this down. So you, you wrote this down in this chat here. You know what that means? That, that you, you have actually put it on, on paper or, or whatever this is here. You put it down somewhere. What does that mean? That means that you're getting a handle on it. When you're able to name something, you, you, when you name it, you're able to exercise some kind of power over it. Why did God tell Adam to name the animals? So that he could understand that he had a sense of power over those animals. God was turning them over to him so that he could care for them 
and he named them. So if you're able to say, I have self-doubt, I have an unforgiving spirit, I overextend myself, you're able to say, oh, wait a minute, I recognize this about me. Let me work on fixing it with the power that God gives me. Sasha says, uh, I'll confess I'm languishing in discipline. And, and then she adds, I cannot be disciplined. I feel like I cannot be disciplined in my prayer life. And that is where, and that is where you take it to the Lord. And you pray for one minute, or you pray for two minutes, or you pray for five minutes, or you pray as you walk, or you pray as you shower. You let the Holy Spirit remove the guilt and let him overwhelm you. Let him overwhelm you with his love. Because what can happen is that we allow these things that are negative to take over our psychology. And then guess what? Before you know it, we're wallowing in self-pity. We're no longer able to do the things that we used to do because it's like we have a great weight on our shoulders. We need to let the Holy Spirit pull us out of these areas where our psychology has now become informed by guilt, by self-doubt, by ridicule, by remembering the past and saying, wow, I'm never going to be a good servant of the Lord. All of those things. That's really important. Sasha says, I feel like I set prayer goals and don't meet them. I know God is listening in our daily dialogue, but finding intimate prayer time is hard for me. So I'll tell you what to do. Stop setting a prayer goal and just pray. Forget the goal. Just pray. Let the goal come later on. Maybe it's too soon to set a goal. Just pray. So we're going to come to a close here. There's one more section <clears throat> here. I'm not going to cover it because it's going to take a little bit of time, and I, I like to be true to what I say. We're going to finish at, at 8 o'clock. Um, when we meet again next week, we will begin with how... We work on psychology and theology by three aspects of theology that inform us through our behavior, our emotions, and our thoughts. But we will come to that next week. So we have about two minutes and 40 seconds left. Any comments or any questions before we come to a close? And then I'll mention what we're going to speak about next week. Comments or questions? Anybody? I can hear you click clacking away there. Okay, Edith says this is great. Thank you. You're very welcome, Eddie. You're very welcome. I'm glad this was instructive for you. Um, whenever I give a class, I know that I get <laughs> I get the brunt of it because I have to. Uh, 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 understand where I'm coming from also. But thank you for your support and for being here. Carmen says, uh, great class. Hey, hey, William, didn't see you before. Says, good job. Thank you. It is my pleasure. Next week, <clears throat> we're going to talk about uh, a very interesting topic. We're going to talk about the problem of evil. E-V-I-L. And remember, we're talking about the integration of psychology and theology. So next week, we're going to talk about evil. Where does evil come from? Why does evil exist? How can Christians perpetrate evil acts? Why are evil acts continually perpetrated if God is so powerful? We're going to get into all that next week. Ricky says, um, I believe these lessons to be very insightful and reflective, encouraging me to be a better, well-rounded servant. Amen. 
and me too. That's exactly what I want to be. Better equipped to help others in the future. And that's what we're called to do, right? Help somebody. Be a helper. Don't be such a great helper that you don't take care of your family. Take care of the people around you. But keep in mind that the Lord has purpose and calling for everybody here. And as you partake in his divine nature, he will make it clear to you. So remember, next week, we are going to be speaking about the problem of evil. So go look at uh, stuff about evil, um, and we're going to talk about that from a theological and psychological perspective. Remember, we're doing the integration of psychology and theology. We'll speak about the problem of evil next week. God bless you all. Have a good night. Um, what happens with this now is um, I shut it down, and I will um, have it recorded on Open Door Ministries um, website, and you will be able to replay it. I'll probably do that, um, if not tomorrow, um, Friday, or on the weekend, and then you'll just be able to see it over and over again as, as you like. So God bless you all. Have a blessed night, and I'll see you guys soon. Take care.